as you've been sitting out in the audience today, uh, listening to the, the sort of yin and yang of these different discussions about direct-to-consumer, the impact of technology, as people who spend their uh, li work at working lives living and breathing sport, what's that balancing act that you're striking between uh, your direct relationships with your fans, uh, with your followers, um, and your relationships with platforms? Start with Darren. Uh, I think I think it's actually covered very well in the in the previous presentations. It's about content that matters, and sport matters. People care passionately about sport. Uh, in a way which is coming into it quite new, which I've only been in it for, for seven or eight months, is quite palpable on a daily basis. But actually, a lot of the challenges are very similar. We are a direct-to-consumer business. We're about content. We're creating seasons and story arcs, and we talk about things in the same way that are actually very similar to the way that the creative industry talks about television content. So, so the similarities and parallels, and I think a lot of the challenges are, are actually broadly similar with what's going on in the TV space. John. Yeah, for, we are a direct consumer business. Um, we are the leading sports, pure OTT sports business in the world at the moment. So, you know, delivering for our customers and, and our fans around the world has been, you know, our, our singular focus. So, I think I agree that sport is the last appointment to view television in that way. And, and I think what we've seen is that there was a, a real reticence that would OTT be able to deliver to the scale that, uh, that, that is expected around those sports events. And you know, we announced last year we did 121 events of over a million simultaneous uh, concurrent streams. So you can deliver to scale. We're delivering to that scale. And we're delivering in a way that the engagement levels are even higher than on traditional platforms. So I think it's OTTs playing a great role in growing that engagement levels for the sports, which is absolutely critical as well. Great, Barbara. Yes, and, and I mean taking a look from the, if you like, the viewer um, at home's point of view. I, I think currently, and from a broadcasting point of view, in terms of sport, I just think we've had an ecology that's actually delivered unbelievable benefits to that audience. Choice that just wasn't there in the past, breadth and range that that, that kind of wasn't there, and that ecology is a balance between free-to-air, OTT, pay. It's a delicate balance, and I think it's important that all elements are play a part in it. Because actually, I think some of the, the broadcast ecology we have in this country is, is the envy of the world. And that, um, you know, I, I think that there's, there's, there's aspects of that that need to be, to, to, to be saved. You know. Well, I guess if the question is, uh, what's more important, the relationship with platforms or the relationship with end consumers, it's almost impossible to answer that question because I think they're both absolutely critical. So Premier League is uh, the world's biggest league and the world's biggest sport, and the strength of the Premier League is really a big part of it is through the relationships that we have with broadcasters that do such a fantastic job of putting on the show all across the world in very, very different ways, whether that is free-to-air, pay, OTT, there's a whole load of different ways they do that, and we're, we're hugely blessed to have such a great array of platforms and broadcasters to do that. But equally, for the clubs, the relationship that we have with the end consumers or what we would, of course, call our fans is critical as well. So we are direct-to-consumer broadcasters as well. We have a direct relationship with the content that we own straight to the consumer, whether that is a transactional relationship where we're charging people um, and monetizing that relationship to invest in the pitch, or whether it's what we do at Arsenal, which is we don't charge for that content, but we collect data, we put that through our CRM system, and monetize that in different ways so we can invest back into the pitch to make the best possible product to make the virtuous circle go round. I mean, man, you are, the, I think, it's the biggest football franchise globally, isn't it? So uh, you've got a very biggest. considerable <laughs> uh, direct-to-consumer fan base. Um, we were chatting earlier about that sort of dynamic of therefore you controlling more of your own data versus having that sort of gate kept by one of the platforms. How are you managing that balancing act? Yeah, I mean, I'd, I'd echo what Vinay has, has said. The, the only thing I'd add to that, I'd say, is um, I, I think sports kind of content generators have been slow to embracing the direct-to-consumer part. And we've, we've used and lent on our partners who've done a fantastic job, um, which is tremendous. Um, but a little bit like the comments we heard on the discovery part of the conversation, I think um, people want to consume sport and other content in very different, in very different ways. And the super 
fan is one that is probably very ill-served today uh, in terms of giving them what they want, when they want, and how they want it. So for some, they'd love to know how Pogba's rehabilitation is going. For others, they want to know who Martial's partner is. And those could be very different people, and we need to know who they are, what they want to consume, and, and provide that. Um, today, in terms of sort of owning more, more of that data, I think actually we've allowed the partners to do so. So today, the Premier League is, is a, a huge league, the preeminent league, but actually Sky and BT have pretty much all of the data of the people who are consuming that. Um, only when we go direct to consumer do we start to have a better idea of who those fans are and through our CRM systems be able to serve them much better. And is that people buying tickets um, and streaming games they can't get to? What, what's the product proposition if I'm a super fan? Well, see, for, for us, I, I'd say clubs have generally done a, 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 I'd say a very good job with fans who come to the stadium. But frankly, for, for all of us, that's um, less than point of a percent of, yeah. of our global fans. And so we've got fans all around the world, and it's the fans who consume the games out of the stadium who we have almost no relationship with. And so by, by launching our apps, and so we've got, uh, we launched only, only 18 months ago, okay, so one of the biggest clubs in the world, um, and we launched a, a free app only 18 months ago. Um, and, and that's been transformative, actually, for us in terms of how we start to think about our fans and how we start to think about um, servicing those fans and thinking beyond the Stretford end and the people who come to Old Trafford, because that is just a small minority. And is that quite a global audience you're appealing to? A a absolutely, yeah. yeah. I mean, it's, it's huge in Asia. It, frankly, the Premier League is very lucky because we follow the British Empire. Yeah. Um, and that was obviously very strong and in very key parts of the world. So very large in Asia, Africa, and the Middle East. And even our American brethren kind of still remember what home used to be. And how much should I be spending if I'm getting all of the full fat app service? Well, so, I lived in another, outside the UK. Yeah, so we have a great free um, app, a free front porch, if you like. And today we have a separate MUTV offering, which previously was linear. We've added a, the mobile piece and put that in the app. And so today you can buy that for five pounds a month. Um, that gives you access to our tour games that we have in the summer that you can't get anywhere else, together with lots of behind the scenes um, content. Um, we've seen that be very powerful in terms of shifting the average age of our, of our of our consumers. So it used to be, I think, 53 was the average age of the linear consumer on MUTV. It's now 40. Um, and I think it's something like 72% of our users on our app are less than 35 years old. So in terms of, again, the earlier comments about millennials and Gen Zs, yeah. we think it's critical that actually our industry focuses more on ensuring that the next wave of fans are there and we can work with the linear and mainstream broadcasters by helping use our platforms to get access to the fans to then funnel them onto the live oh, games. I've got it. Darren, you're year one of, uh, I'm <laughs> sure, a journey that will um, take a few years to sort of come to full fruition. But if you were thinking ahead of where you want your uh, products to be um, in terms of its sort of public appeal and engagement, what's, what's your sort of mid to long term vision? Yeah, we, we, we again watched what Premier League has done since it went professional in 92 and, and uh, rugby went professional in 1995. Um, and so we're kind of a little bit behind the curve, but we're in a business where the interest in the product that we create is just growing. Back of the World Cup, um, which has just happened uh, out, in, out in Tokyo, the fan base is increasing. You know, there's 300 million active uh, rugby fans on, on the globe. And the great thing about technology now is it allows us to actually start to connect with those. So, you know, the old broadcast model was you had to have scale in markets in order to sell your shows or your, or your leagues or your games. The great thing about OTT is that actually we can write a piece of code in Twickenham uh, which can deliver a live game to, to someone in Tonga at the same time that someone's watching it, somebody is watching it in Twickenham. So I think the world, the delivery ecosystem will benefit sport because it means we can now become super global and, and tap into those super fans. Uh, around the world. So from a PRL perspective, we are in growth mode. Uh, we're in investment mode. We're at the start of, start of that journey. We've had a, an interesting six months with things like salary caps, and now we've got another challenge which is hitting us in terms of live, live events with uh, what's going on with the coronavirus, and we've, got to, we've certainly got to deal with, uh, with that. So we've had a few things that are kind of hitting us uh, head on, but the things that we're very much focused on are investing in the product, 
bringing in those passive fans that will come to, say, an England game. You know, it's no, it's no uh, accident that the kind of largest, second largest show on TV last year was a rugby match, sec semi-finals, um, um, England versus New Zealand out in Japan doing 14, 15 million viewers. So we know that there's a huge interest in our yeah. product. We've now got to take all the grit and the friction out which stops people getting access to that. And, uh, and that's where our investment and focus is going to be. Got it. John Barber, you're, you're, um, you've been doing quite a lot on sort of the, the sort of, I suppose, the less mass market sports. Mm -hmm. um, it's often said, I think, the BBC, you know, that, that, that uh, in terms of d delivering the remit, you're bringing attention to sort of yes. new sports. I know, Barbara, you've been passionate about, um, about bringing in women's football, for example, yes. and really championing that and making it much more mainstream. Um, again, what's the balance between sort of the free-to-air window that gets that reach for those, for those smaller sports, for those growing sports, versus the streaming proposition, uh -huh. which allows it to go into sort of micro-targeting? How does the BBC think that through? Well, I think the interesting thing last summer, which was a, a great example, was, was putting women's football in the mainstream. It was on BBC One. It had a trails campaign behind it that matched what the BBC would do for a Christmas campaign. And I don't not that sure everybody quite knew that what, that that would actually deliver. But when you think the all-time record for previous women's football match was four million, Channel Four, for Channel Four, uh, semi-final <laughs> of the Euros, <laughs> yeah. So um, the equivalent match, having had that, if you like, given those prime slots, was nearly twelve million. And there will be very very few properties that you could see a trajectory like that. Yeah. Um, and I think that's one of the things the BBC does. It gives a platform. You know, our mission, if you like, is to tell every sports story every single day. And there is an ability through that to amplify. And, and I think that's one of the reasons why governing bodies want to work with the BBC. It's because we can add profile. And, and we bring new audiences because of our very position. And actually, I think that's a benefit, mm -hmm. both to, mm -hmm. if you like, services that, that are looking to provide that, that super fan. Um, you need a short window. I mean, it's very interesting, the Premier League. Match of the day, good old match of the Jesus day, Christ. in however many decades it's been, delivers to Premier League football 60% of the viewership in the UK. Mm. That is a very precious thing. It's an important thing. Paywalls are a big barrier to lots of people. 60% of Premier League fans consume the Premier League via match of the day. That's something we're very proud of. And, and I hope, you know, it's a welcome part Absolutely. of an Very ecology so. that actually, is, you know, has brought incredible wealth and success to football. Mm -hmm. You know, the Premier League is, you know, the, the global league. It's, it's fantastic. And many different stakeholders play a part in that. Unfortunately, we haven't got a lot of time left. So I just want to touch on, uh, we were talking, John, last night about the challenges you're facing. You have a lot of Italian football, and suddenly yeah. that is now, we're now in, into a new phase of mm. restrictions. Just share with the audience a little bit about um, how you're managing that. Well, to be honest, it's, you know, it's something that is very, obviously, hot topic at the moment, and it's come on to us relatively quickly, but the, the games are gonna be behind closed doors. As a broadcaster, we have a very big audience in Italy, already so that in terms of accessibility to the football fans our belief is you know they can get there to to the point about it's very easy to access our service our service is on 96 percent of all devices in the marketplace so so whether you you don't have to wait to get you know a satellite box or whatever in you can get accessibility very quickly and i think the other important po point is affordability so one of the, the key elements for our service was affordability. In Italy, it's €9.99, Euro and we offer three Serie A matches this weekend. So, so if someone wants to watch their team, they can do in a very affordable way. Vinay, is that uh, kind of, obviously, it's a very fast-moving situation, but where do you see um, the Premier, Premier League matches? Sort of, ha What's the contingency plan for the next few weeks? Well, it's very much what um, the government has said publicly. So at the moment, there is no guidance from the government that games in the Premier League should be played behind closed doors. So the Premier League will go on as, it always, always been, as it's always gone on. If the situation changes and the medical advice has changes, then the clubs will look at it with the Premier League. But at the moment, um, it's exactly as the government has said. There's no reason for Premier League matches not to go ahead uh, in a full stadium. And will you be looking to broadcasters to sort of work in a different way if that is necessary? 
Listen, I think if we get to a stage where, if we get to a stage through medical advice that something needs to change, it would be mm. an unprecedented step. Yeah. And I think we would have to look at all of the outcomes. What I don't want to do today is speculate around what might happen in the future. I think there's enough hysteria out there for all of us. Uh, and I certainly don't want to contribute to, to it. So I'll leave that, leave that to the experts and if the medical advice changes then we'll react to it. But obviously, all the clubs are talking about it and, and making sure that we're ready if we have to make such decisions. Great. Well, um, good luck in navigating those new <laughs> challenges. But more broadly, I'm sure we'll be here in a year's time with lots of new learning, and we'll want to hear again how all your services are developing for then. Please thank our sports panel.